Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Siviana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, guys, whether you're watching us on YouTube or on Rumble. I'm very excited today to have Mr. Alistair Cook with me. In Arabic, we say he is Ghaniyon an tarif which means he is too famous to be introduced. And I'm sure most of you already following him on Judge Napolitana. He's been a regular guest on that very good YouTube channel, in my opinion. However, if you do not know Mr. Alistair, he is a former senior British diplomat. He advised EU policy chief Javier Solana, and he is the director of Conflict Forum and a political expert with over 35 years of experience. Mr. Alistair, it's a privilege for me to have you on my channel. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. No, it's my privilege to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Guys, 
Just a quick personal story. 12 years ago, uh, when I was searching for a job in Beirut as a fresh grad in a master degree in political science, and I went to the office of Alistair searching for a job back then as a political researcher. That was the first time I met him. He is also a great person himself and uh, his wife. And I personally, in the past few years, since I also launched my YouTube channel, I learned from people like Alistair because it's very important for people to listen to experience people with intellectual capacity when they are especially uh, spreading, um, uh, let's say, when they are uh, analyzing the political conflicts from a critical point of view that nowadays it's uh, really difficult to find critical minds, unfortunately, when we turn on our TV channels. Mr. Alistair, five and a half months passed since Israel launched its onslaught on Gaza. The death toll today has risen to 32,000 Palestinians. Most of Gaza is destroyed and inhabitable. Starvation and mal malnutrition have spread in the besieged strip. What do the horrors inflicted upon the Palestinians in Gaza tell us about the U.S.-led rules-based order in light of the ongoing legal process against Israel at the ICJ? Well, that's a big, you've opened a, a very big question about uh, that because, first of all, there is the question uh, about its impact on Israel. And then it's about the impact of Israel on the United States. And one of the reasons I think we see a great frenzy in Europe and a frenzy in the United States is because there is nowadays in Israel, a very clear um, existential fear. Mm -hmm. They can see that what has happened in, 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 uh, on the 7th of October effectively bro broke the paradigm, smashed the paradigm utterly of both types of deterrence that Israel had. One sort of deterrence was the, the, the sort of social contract that uh, most Jews felt they had that wherever they lived in the land of Israel, the IDF, the Israeli government, had their backs, no question to it. And all of that collapsed. And it's collapsed not only around Gaza, but now in the north, where there are some nearly a million Israelis who've been displaced from their homes in the north and are living at government expense in, in the hotels on the Dead Sea and thereabouts. Um, and then the other part, and this is becoming the more predominant element, I feel, in Israel at the moment, is this um, fear that the Zionist project as such just cannot survive if the world does not fear Israel. If they are unable to fear Israel, if they don't fear Israel, then they feel that they cannot live in, 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 in the Middle East. Now, how this connects into the United States and, uh, and Europe it, it is, in my view, in this way, it, in that much of the power structures in the United States, same as Europe, but the power structures in the United States are dependent on the cause of Israel, on the idea of Israel per se, to give them legitimacy, to give them credibility, to give them purpose to their desire and their ability to control politics in the House of um, House of Representatives in the in the U.S. Uh, and in the elections, um, and they, if there is a fear that Israel will not survive this um, uh, conflict, then their purpose, their aim their idea disappears and collapses. Yes. And the same for Europe, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very strong process. So those platforms, so it works the other way around to what most people's, I think, generally the consensus view, which is, you know, that Israel is totally dependent on the United States. Actually, the main power structures in the United States are wholly dependent on, 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 on Israel. And, yes. of course, Israel knows how to manage them extremely well uh, for its own purposes. So it's back to front. Yeah. 
Mr. Alessio, but it feels for me that Israel is uh, turning around, as we say in Arabic, an empty circle. Uh, in the Gaza Strip, probably they can destroy the entire Gaza Strip, and probably they can go after Hamas, because Hamas has modest uh, military capabilities compared to Hezbollah. But for Hezbollah, if the Israelis now want for their settlers to come back to the north, they are speaking about going into war against Hezbollah itself. However, the Americans, uh, apparently, they evaluated the strength of the uh, Hezbollah side, and they're warning uh, Israel against going into war uh, against Hezbollah. But in, in, a, in a scenario, look, I'm... I'm, I'm an, as, an, as an analyst, I can see that sanity ha- is, is, doesn't exist nowadays in Tel Aviv. And uh, Netanyahu could go into such an adventure against um, Lebanon. And if it happens, then the airports of Israel will be neutralized, the ports will be neutralized, and the entire concept of Israel that you already mentioned, that this is a safe haven for the Jewish people, it will completely be destroyed Right. Hmm. So I see that Israel is in a self-suicidal mission by itself. They're shooting themselves in the leg. And the their enemies, Hezbollah and Hamas, they're just holding their hands and taking them into the trap. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, this has been a long time in the preparation, been carefully thought through. It's not just Hamas. I mean, Hamas uh, played a pivotal role in this, of, of course. But they've been preparing and prepared for it. I, I, I think that Hamas are, are largely un, intact. They're deep underground, up to 70 meters deep. They have facilities deep underground, hospitals, workshops, dormitories. Um, and uh, they've sustained a little damage. Uh, but in fact, um, Israel has sustained huge damage in Gaza. And it's been very unnerving for them because they call them like, you know, these are the jinn. <laughs> they, <laughs> they come out of the ground, they yes. attack, and they're gone <laughs> like ghosts. Yes. And, um, and so they've, and particularly in Khan Yunus, I think they've suffered uh, huge uh, uh, losses, uh, bad losses. Uh, and I think the army are frightened. The IDF are frightened of going into Rafa. And I'm sure Hamas has been preparing uh, for their arrival in Rafah. So they have supplies, they have weapons and ammunition. They prepared for a long exercise. Mm -hmm. But when you turn around and then you say what you did say about uh, that Hezbollah is a different, completely different matter, of course it's, I mean, quite different in that sense. And I, I have to say, I, I'm still somewhat bemused. Now, there are Israelis, people like General Brick and others, who have been a, he's been a contrarian for a lot of his career, and have been warning, what are you doing? Going, you know, thinking of going into Lebanon. Why, I mean, how can you do this? Do you not know that, I mean, they have missiles that can reach all of Israel, cruise missiles, smart drones, swarm drones, all of these things. And, you know, 2006 wasn't so great for us, is what Rick was really saying, warning. So for me, I don't understand how America and Israel uh, sincerely contemplate this prospect. I think it's going to happen. It has to happen because the residents of the Galilee in the north have said very plainly to the government, and they're angry, and it's becoming a huge political issue. They say, you know, are we going home? A lot of them are not going home. They've just left the place, and they say, well, we're not going back. And the government says, well, we provide you protection, and they say, forget it. That's not what Mm -hmm. we want. Look, we are not going to live next to the fence where we yes. can see Hezbollah and its flags and its soldiers through the fence, never. And so they're trying to contain this, but in my view, inevitably, there's going to be some, some measure. Now, uh, there's a hope, the Israelis hope and the Americans hope that somehow they can have a, a diplomatic agreement uh, uh, in Lebanon uh, uh, that will allow for... <laughs> 
Hezbollah to be moved north of the Litani. Uh, well, this is ridiculous. You, you've lived there. You know it's ridiculous. This is so <laughs> ridiculous. Asking Hezbollah to withdraw to the north of Litani. The people who are fighting in Hezbollah are the people who are the villagers, the people of the towns of this uh, of the borders with Israel, and and the last offer. Um, that the Americans submitted to the Lebanese government that Hezbollah would only withdraw its heavy and uh, weaponry to the north of Litani. And I ask myself sometimes really, like, are they mocking us? Is this a joke? Because how can Hezbollah move its long-range missiles and, uh, for example, the heavy weaponry to the north of Litani uh, on the ground? Because most of them are stored under the ground. Are they going to dig in now new tunnels to move all this uh, weaponry? I mean, even technically and engineering-wise, it doesn't make sense what the Americans are offering to uh, the Lebanese side. And this is in my... Uh, I agree with you that this could also escalate on the Lebanese borders, and this will be a huge miscalculation for uh, the Israeli side, especially mm -hmm. that I, uh, I followed what Hezbollah did in Syria, mm -hmm. and they're game changers. You know, they're the real game changers on the mm -hmm. ground. They are competent fighters, they're skilled, and they have the uh, ideology to fight, right? Uh, they, they are craving for this fight for quite a long time, and they could also occupy the north of Galil if Israel occupies this. Now, we know that this escalation is happening and also the continuation of the onslaught against Gaza, but in parallel, politically, for example, in the United States, recently Senator Schumer, uh, he represents a state with more than 20% of Jewish, Jewish population. He criticized Netanyahu's government and said Netanyahu is a major obstacle to peace in the Middle East. Now we have Canada, uh, they uh, refuse to approve new arms export permits to Israel until Ottawa can ensure the weapons are used in accordance to Canadian law. I mean, this raises the question, are these wake-up calls for uh, this uh, in Washington DC and in Ottawa by the so-called liberals or they're seeking political survival since there are elections uh, ahead of us? Uh, essentially, they're seeking a scapegoat to mm -hmm. to try and limit the damage. You may have seen, I don't know if your viewers or listeners um, saw the outcome in Michigan, um, but there, um, there were, the activists had tried to get together about 10,000 votes um, yeah. uncommitted, and they ended up with more than 100,000. So the, the Democratic Party is spooked by this, um, if you like, shift. So I think what we're talking about is a really fundamental changes taking place in the whole American constituency. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, young Jews are pro-Palestinian, essentially, yeah. now, at the moment, more than their elder elders. The elders are still, so roughly 70%, I think, of Israelis mostly support Israel. But they are having a great deal of difficulty because much of the Arab population is in the swing states, these key states that really determine who wins the presidential election. Swing in that sense. They can swing one way or mm -hmm. the other way. And um, so they're very influential. And then um, you have a lot of the progressive wing of the diplomatic, of the Democratic Party who are um, now unhappy. Yeah. And w what we're seeing, I think, here, uh, I mean, first of all, it wasn't as sort of Schumer presented it, that, that uh, actually that, uh, you know, they were, Biden and Schumer were divorcing Netanyahu. Netanyahu had divorced them about 10 years ago when <laughs> he switched. Um, I mean, he could see, and anyone, I, I mean, I was there at that time and saw, you know, it was obvious to me that the um, Likud and the right parts of Israeli spectrum were on a completely different path. And, you know, as the Democrats were becoming more woke, I mean, the threat to Israel was becoming more obvious. What does wokeism, you know, what is the essence of it? It is, if you like, rectifying the past failures of identity and racial justice in the world yes. and in America. And well, where is that going to be obviously displayed? Well, of course, for the Palestinians in Israel. 
And mm. so it seemed obvious that they were going to split. And then, you know, there was a big debate and then they turned to the Republicans. But they turned, first of all, and saw the door into the United States, no longer liberal Jews in New York. It was now to be the evangelicals who are yeah. predominantly in the Republican Party. And it was the evangelicals that were the patrons of the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to Jerusalem. But what it underlines, this whole thing really is, and I think this is what's worrying the Democrats very seriously, is that it's becoming clear to much of their base the um, in New York and the liberal views who predominantly vote for the Democratic Party that liberal Jew is an oxymoron. You can't be a Zionist, sorry, a liberal Zionist is an oxymoron. You can't be liberal and a Zionist, and, as we're seeing taking place um, in, in, in Israel and, and in Gaza at this time. And they're very disconcerted. They're very, you know, they're bowled over by this and they don't quite know what to do. They support Israel, but they just don't like it. And so hence Schumer comes up in the attempt to sort of try and balance the two ends of sort of looking tough on Netanyahu, mm -hmm. which the White House isn't tough on Netanyahu at all. And at the same time, sort of lower the flames a bit of the um, anxieties and pressures coming from um, ordinary liberal reformist Jews uh, in, in the United States. So the whole spectrum, in a sense, is becoming very fluid. Um, and you get changes and also, you know, certain population groups, the black population is changing its sort of allegiance and um, older and Generation Z are becoming <laughs> quite different <laughs> again. <laughs> So it's very fluid. So I think it's hard to draw hard and fast um, conclusions beyond these. Left and right, blue and red, don't yeah. make sense anymore. We're talking about changes that cut across um, those old definitions, um, and we're in an, a new era. And what's happened in Israel is the fulcrum to that happening, has really mm. caused that to, to happen. And so it will continue and change further in the United States, and less so in Europe. My feeling about Europe, I don't know what you think, but my sense, because I know you're living in Europe, but my sense is that um, only when America changes and has its counter-revolution succeeds or fails, then Europe will change. But until the outcome of what happens in the next year and a half in the United States, I think Europe will largely stay dormant and will double down on repression and enforcement uh, uh, of protest in Europe. Actually, I agree with you that a change in the United States, whether positively or negatively or to any direction, will have the detrimental factor over the course of the change in Europe and especially in Germany, where I live. And uh, from the actions and the statements of the state politicians here, uh, those who are in the governing coalition nowadays, you can see clearly that even the terminologies are similar with the American foreign policy literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are trying to be American more than the Americans themselves and mm -hmm. to be to prove that they are loyal allies to the United States. And in the discourse of trying to prove that they have Americanized their foreign policy approach, they have lost their uh, national security um, uh, whatever they left have left from the national security, for example, the Nord Stream pipeline, right? And the war with Russia nowadays, that this escalation that is happening against Russia, I do not see it from my perspective that it is in the interest of Germany or in the interest of France or in the interest of the Baltic countries. However, we see this hysteria. We're going to discuss this in the second stage of this uh, conversation. 
And uh, I also see that a turmoil is going to hit in Europe and dark days are ahead mm. in Europe, especially when it comes to the economy, because when the economy collapses, I mean, I'm not I'm not predicting that the economy could collapse in this fast pace, but we are already in a recession here in Germany. And we are already, uh, myself, when I pay the bills, I know that uh, the value of the euro it, when, when you're paying your bills have become less and less and less, right? And when there is economic uh, problem, and this will lead to the people to elect, for example, parties like AFD, uh, the right-wing party, a party that has never been in, in, in the coalition. And if the German uh, state uh, receives uh, or suffers from a huge economic uh, problem, for example, in my opinion, from my observation, this is just my subjective opinion, the stability of the country or the social stability in the country, one of its pillars is the social welfare of the, of the, uh, of the government. That is, the government is able to pre- present or to offer social welfare to the people. If you're a jobless, I can pay for you for a month, two, a year, or two or three. But you have a newcomers in Germany. You have the migrants, you have the refugees. And for example, the Syrian refugees who arrived in Germany, uh, around 1 million of them now, uh, 55% of them are still jobless and they are still on the social welfare. So if the government cannot pay to the people, then what the people are going to do? in order to secure their livelihood, right? So there are different questions that, in my opinion, the uh, government is not really addressing well here. But who am I to judge? I'm just a Syrian living here, and I don't have suicidal thoughts to continue criticizing the government in Berlin, harshly. So I stick with my um, this uh, soft uh, criticism, I would say. I mean, there are also different things in, in, in Gaza, uh, Mr. Alistair, one of which I, I is... I just want to, just before you please, leave that su- subject, just a little bit, because mm. um, it's very interesting what you're saying, because, um, yes, it's, you know, the Europe has been fractured by this sw- swerve towards America by Baerbock and Alina Baerbock principally leading it. And, and it's broken the, it, the old sort of a tandem of France and Germany mm-hmm. and broken it further because Germany is now working closely uh, with Tusk, Tusk as a, as a sort of new best friend in, in the region. And that threatens France and other states um, considerably. Yeah. So it's having, a, 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 as you say, a, a, a really an effect of, of, of breaking up um, the structures of Europe. And at a time, as you so clearly put, I mean, living standards are crashing in Europe, not just going down, they are crashing. I mean, we have most people in Italy I think is well over half the population are having real difficulty paying the bills. And we also have a large population that is not getting um, the, of immigrants that are coming in. And it's going to end up very badly in Europe, I think. You're quite right. This is the unfortunate truth. And um, you are not even allowed to speak about these cases nowadays. Uh, they, the, the cancel culture is very quick. You get canceled, you lose your job, uh, you get framed by the press if you say something about this, and they commit what is called character assassination. And then you will never, ever find a job again if you are trying to work in the public field. Um, Mr. Alistair, just last question about uh, Gaza itself. And there is uh, this uh, proposal Paul's port for for Gaza, and what's the what's the real purpose behind the American <laughs> proposal for port? Netanyahu yesterday in his security cabinet he suggested that the port could facilitate the removal of the Palestinians from Gaza. Well, it rang a bell for me because back long time ago, two thousand and one, I did the negotiations for the Church of um, nativity in Bethlehem. It was under mm-hmm. siege and there were a lot of Palestinians. And we had a long negotiation about that. But of course, at the end of it, um, Israel imposed the um, uh, absolute um, necessity from their perspective accepted by the United States that some of those would be deported out of Israel, not go back to Gaza, they would be de- deported. And what happened was that I was delegated to receive these so-called terrorists 
I knew most of them because I knew Bethlehem quite well. And uh, I and I took them in a m military aircraft to Hercules, where to Cyprus, mm -hmm. where, from where they were dispersed <laughs> around Europe. And I don't know if you recall that episode, but it seemed to me quite quite familiar. Yeah, I think the idea of I think is twofold. This idea of going to Cyprus. Mm. One is I understand the ports authority in Haifa came to the government. And they said, look, I mean, if things continue as they are, we need a fallback position because Haifa might close, and Ashdod as well. These are the two main ports coming into uh, to Israel. Um, Elat is already closed. Um, so we need to have a, a, a sort of fallback plan B, and that plan B has got to be uh, Cyprus. And so the ports authority leaders were, were delegated to go to Cyprus and negotiate either buying a harbor or building a harbor there, both for trade, but then I think also it's been the idea is from Netanyahu, if we're not going to get them into the Sinai, then let's use Cyprus just as in 2001 <laughs> <laughs> we distributed them from Cyprus around Europe in, in that way. I, I can't say that that is what he remembers, but I'm just saying this was a, if you like, uh, perhaps a, a forerunner of uh, thinking in that way. And this idea did come from Netanyahu. It didn't come from the Americans about Cyprus and the no. and the time and the temporary pier. Yeah. yeah, recall, of course. I mean, it's very important for your viewers and listeners to know. Actually, <laughs> Gaza had both an international airport and a full harbor once both have been completely destroyed that's right i want to just uh, mention a quick information and i was with a friend um he is a member of the parliament here and um, he mentioned to me in an indirect way that there are negotiations in european governments they are even speaking about quotas how many palestinians are they going to receive later in the second stage and the third stage from the gaza strip and we've seen these uh, six European leaders who recently went to Egypt at the same time, on the same day, and they announced an $8.1 billion funding package uh, for Egypt. I mean, it smells political corruption to many people and persuasion of uh, Cairo to accept the 2 million Palestinians for Gaza, right? Uh, yes, it, it, it's not just corruption of al-Nakba, that this is a new Nakba that is being planned. There's no doubt that that is the case. And I, I've heard much bigger figures that have been offered to Egypt. I mean, billions and billions. I mean, the Europeans is a drop by, by comparison, useful drop because Egypt is, is, is in financial, deep financial crisis at the moment. And so far, it isn't working, mainly because um, the Egyptian army is terrified to have um, uh, the Palestinians flowing into Sinai. They, they fear not just turmoil, they fear revolution hmm. in Egypt. Because although the top strand of the e Egyptian army is mm, has their fingers in the economic pie, clearly, and does very well from it, once you get down the, the ranks to sort of uh, colonel major and below, I mean, many of these people are poor. There is something like 43% of Egyptian Families live on less than two dollars a day, and many of them are pious M Muslims, um, particularly in the rural areas, and sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood, yes. from which Hamas um, was an offshoot. So um, they're just trying to prop up. I think the uh, Europeans are just trying to prop up uh, Egypt. They fear that if it collapses, then they'll have a huge immigration problem. On 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 their doorstep, um, but yes, I mean, there's certainly from the outset the CIA plan was uh, that uh, CC would open the gates of Rafah and they'd all uh, leave Gaza and the settlers would sort of take over in their in their wake. So I mean, it was intended to be another um, Nakba process underway it still is it hasn't mm -hmm. 
that whole idea hasn't gone away and um we don't know um you know what would happen if, if yeah. there is an assault into gaza wow Mr. Alistair, if we move a little bit to the eastern uh, side, to Eurasia and especially to Ukraine, and today I was uh, reading a new report by the Institute for the Study of War, which I used to read during the Syrian war as well, and they have gotten the Syrian war, of course, horribly wrong, but they are now making new predictions. They say several Russian financial, economic, and military indicators suggest that Russia is preparing for a large-scale conventional conflict conflict with NATO, not imminently, but likely on a shorter timeline than what some Western analysts have initially uh, predicted. Putin is likely attempting to set conditions to stabilize Russia's long-term financial position at a higher level of government expenditure and is signaling that Russia's long-term financial stability will require imposing at least some pain on some wealthy industrialist Siloviki. The Russian military continues to undertake structural reforms to simultaneously support the war in Ukraine while expanding Russia's conventional capabilities in the long term in preparation for a potential future large-scale conflict with NATO. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigo outlined several ongoing efforts to bolster Russia's conventional military capabilities, more likely as part of Russia's long-term effort to prepare for a potential conventional war with NATO than as part of the war against Ukraine. When I read this report and similar many other reports coming from the talking heads on TV, um, I ask myself this question, how credible and convenient is the Russian threat against Europe and NATO? Is Russia preparing for an offensive war against NATO? Um, or is this um, aimed at the population here in Europe to prepare them psychologically that we have to continue building up our militaries and um, expand the expenditure over the militaries and also for the profit of the military industrial complexes nowadays, because we're also having parallel ones now in Europe. And Ursula von der Leyen is also saying that we have to increase our expenditure and we have to prepare for war, etc., etc. Uh the the report that you read out from that organization uh, is completely is nonsense um i think in the sense that there is absolutely no evidence at all um that putin or the leadership in russia uh was planning to threaten any part of europe uh, they were determined that nato should not be actually on their borders in Ukraine. But they have never claimed an interest. And Putin has even said he doesn't really want, I mean, you know, he he understands that Poland and Romania and Hungary have claims on Western U Ukraine. And and if that's what happens in, in the future, I mean, they are actually more suited to go there than to yeah. join with Russia. So it's there's no evidence for this at all. Uh, what's happening, I think, is, is two things. This is, I mean, all this talk about Swedish children having to learn to sort of go under the desks at school is pure propaganda coming out of the European Union leadership and aimed at its own population because they are, uh, we are in a real struggle about financing the European Union. It, the process all these transitions and plans that the Europeans had, I mean, from the pandemic, but climate change to the greening project, all of these CO2 projects, I mean, required huge money printing um, to finance them. And this was all right, so long as interest rates were zero. In, in Germany, they were actually negative, as you probably recall during that period. So it cost nothing effectively. And the ECB bought up sovereign bonds and then pushed money back into the system in this way. But now interest rates are up at 5.5% and it's not yes. possible. And the EU does not have a treasury. It doesn't have a treasury system. It cannot raise taxes. Um, the commission, the executive of the EU, cannot raise taxes and obtain cash directly because there's no treasury. There's no treasury equivalent to the US. It is all done through states. They have to raise the money through taxation. 
and then mm. they contribute a po portion to, to the European Union. But it's not like the United States at all. And so they don't know how they are going to get through the next process. So they need a lot more cash coming in in order to try and, if you like, liquefy the system. And for defense is the new transition. Climate is out because it's becoming unpopular. We've got the farmers <laughs> protest. So they are looking at defense. But the magic bullet in all of this is they want to move to war bonds. War wow. bonds not, in, not issued by individual states, by Germany, by Italy, but by the European Union itself and begin the process of direct taxation and the direct raising of money for the European Union, which does not come through member states, and to increase its control over um, the uh, European um, structures um, and states and peoples. So that's really what it's all about. It's about preparing the ground to try and move towards war bonds and even direct taxation of citizens in order to prepare for this great threat coming from mm. Putin that we have to deal with and we have to rebuild a, a defense industry from zero. And that's just going to be a slush fund, basically. Wow. Uh, this is really pessimistic in my opinion, but you are very accurate on this. I totally agree with you. And sometimes I also even wonder if they know the meaning behind the words that they are spewing in media. For example, recently, Baerbock, uh, she challenged um, the chancellor uh, for the delivery of Taurus missiles because Olaf Scholz is hesitant to deliver these Taurus missiles and Baerbock is pushing for the Taurus missiles. And she said, um, we have to deliver everything the Ukrainians need. She said everything the Ukrainians need to defend themselves and uh, defeat Russia. And I don't think that she knows the meaning behind everything when, when we're speaking about the military terms of everything. And then we have uh, Kalas. I will, I will also screen this to you because she had a hilarious statement recently as well. And uh, she says here... Kalas, Russia's defeat crucial to avoid Third World War. She said the West must help Ukraine defeat Russia to avoid a wider conflict. Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kalas has said advocating more EU arms for Kiev and heavier investment in Europe's defense industry. She says, quote, if Russia were to lose this war, then we don't have to worry about the Third World War. I truly <laughs> suspect that she knows what does it mean to defeat Russia, because they cannot define what defeating Russia is, right? Uh, well, this is the path they're pursuing to Third World War. I mean, to be very blunt, there is a report. I can't tell you that it's absolutely true. I can't vouch for it. But there is credible reports that say that the Taurus missile, which has a 500 kilometer range, which would just about reach Moscow in that basis, at its limit, may be nuclear capable. Mm -hmm. If this is so, people ask the question to German officials and they said this classified information, we're not going to reply to you. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know. But if it were, you can imagine the consequences for Russia. They've always said, if, uh, and they've said this for decades, if a missile is launched, and we do not know whether it is nuclear armed or just nuclear capable but unarmed with nuclear weapons, we cannot treat it differently. We will have to assume the worst and then we will respond ourselves automatically with nuclear weapons. It's a hugely dangerous game that they're trying to play of bluff and counter bluff. And what for? In order to try and present, you know, this geopolitical European Union um, that is now a big sort of power actor on the stage and that the European Union um, is going to be, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States and in, in its security interest. But I mean, uh, look, there's no, I mean, there is no European defense industry that to really speak of. Yes, there are bits of it, but most of it has been long hollowed out by competition from the United States. Starting from scratch, if the United States would allow Europe to do it, I mean, will cost far more than the budget that they have of sort of 150, um, 150 billion euros to create this industry. It's nonsense. It's not going to happen. So why are they doing this? 
I mm. think they're trying to keep aloft this idea of a, you know, of a tough Europe as a geopolitical um, state. Um, and Macron has been trying to do this and to try and bluff the Russians into some sort of negotiation so that the Europeans can end up with, you know, the, the, the Russia agrees to a rump Ukraine state coming into existence and the Europeans are saying, that was what we achieved. You know, your, Ukraine still stands and in a few years time it'll be back and, and we'll be able to weaken it or destroy Russia. And of course, Russia has absolutely no intention of allowing that to happen. It's not going to stand back and allow uh, Europeans, Americans, and NATO to rebuild, if you like, a military Trojan horse on its border again. Hmm. Do you agree with the notion that there is... They, the, the military experts of the UK, France, America are already in, in Ukraine, some of which are already undercover uh, military personnel, right? And they know that the front lines could collapse if Russia wages or launches its new offensive. They, they, they're speculating that in this summer. So if the front lines of Ukraine collapses, then um, the central government could also get into a point that is too weak to govern any part of Ukraine, right? Therefore, all this talk about sending ground troops is just to secure the western part of Ukraine if the central mm. government collapses mm. in Kiev, right? Mm. Do you agree with that yeah. notion that they're preparing for that oh. scenario, right? Yeah, just and to keep the, the, the desperate um, to keep a foot in the Black Sea. I mean, mm. this is, you know, it goes on and on about Crimea and Sebastopol and um, Odessa. Uh, but, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, they never, they really never took it into consideration. Avdevka was, you know, their defense line, the Ukrainian yes. defense line, built up over 40, since, you know, 2014, heavily defended, and it fell quickly. And what they never really noticed or took into to view was that behind Alevka, there were no defensive lines, Ukrainian defensive lines. There was no Surovikan lines. There was nothing like that until, because it's mostly open fields. There are a few key towns that are sl mini strongholds, not serious strongholds. And after that, it's fields right up to the Dnieper River and to Kiev. <clears throat> so, you know, it's not surprising that it's accelerating. I mean, we're seeing a sort of cascading collapse of the Ukrainian forces um, because they've got no prepared defensive positions to retreat into. And so those defensive positions keep failing. And then they're trying to retreat back into further non-existent defensive positions. And of course, morale is collapsing because yes. it's like Evdevka. Yes. Mr. Alistair, this is going to be my last uh, question to you. Um, I, I come from Syria and I would like to take this discussion back uh, to Syria. I started this channel because I wanted to inform the people of what's happening in my country or to tell them the other side of the story, right? And in my estimate, the whether it was an uprising, not an uprising, the uh, CIA came and they waged their covert operations, initiated their covert operations in Syria. They wanted to weather the weaken the government or replace Assad to install a puppet government, and they failed in, in this process. However, in my opinion, while Damascus foiled this regime change war, they couldn't manage to win this war. Therefore, now we have one third of the country in the hands of the Americans. The U.S. forces are stealing the oil. The wheat is outside the hand of the government. So the food basket and the fuel is out, out of the reach of the government. We have in the northwest the tens of thousands of Al-Qaeda jihadists in Idlib. We have Turkish forces. And in the south, we have <laughs> Israelis in the Golan Heights. We have American on al tanaf border crossing. It feels like Syria is already in a very, very bad situation. And now they renewed the sanction orgies and the sanction regimes on Syria for another six or eight years. I mean, in your opinion, how could Syria recover from this? I mean, Syria has been weakened a lot and the Americans insisting to continue their sanction regimes, and apparently the Russians are not able to invest in Syria. They are busy with their war now in Ukraine. 
The Chinese aren't coming for with huge investments in Syria because they need stable uh, of, uh, ground to invest. And the Iranians also do not have that capacity to reconstruct the country. So who left? The, uh, the Emirates and the Saudis. But the Emirates and the Saudis are from a different camp and they have their own political, uh, they're asking for political concessions from Damascus, right? It's a really difficult situation. From which side I look, I don't see hope in Syria. What do you think? I think it's really a small miracle that um, Syria has survived everything that has been thrown at it in this period, because everything has been thrown at it during that these you know ten or so years, uh, and it speaks to a huge sort of fortitude and strength, inner strength of the Syrian people. I'm not saying this to flatter you or to the flatter the Syrians. That's my my real uh, feeling about it. I, I do think um, that everything really now hangs. Syria is, by agreement within the re resistance axis, is protected. It's, it's um, if you like, it's infrastructure, it's government infrastructure. They've agreed that Syria should stand back from the war and not because it's vulnerable. It's low-hanging fruit for the... Israelis and the Americans to, to cause further damage. But it's not out of it. It is, if you like, there. And I think that everything really depends on what happens in this region in the next period. And things could change remarkably rapidly. I mean, I was very surprised when, you know, to watch um, uh, President Assad and his wife uh, walking into the Arab League meeting after all the fighting and the, you know, support for, for jihadism that has taken place in, in Syria. And I know it is very frustrating, but already we see the signs um, growing that um, America is going to have to withdraw from northeast Syria. Um, it's I don't know whether Iraq is more problematic, but it seems... That is happening. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is certainly looks as if it's going to happen. We see in Idlib, Jolani, Jolini has great problems controlling it and dealing with it. I think at some point, um, Russia, when the circumstances are appropriate, is going to put forward, if you like, a Minsk Accord mm. for the northern region. But it's hard on the Syrians to have to just wait and be patient even, yes. even longer for, 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 for this to happen. But of course, at the moment, it, it, I, I can't see that either China or Russia together or the BRICS can really do it until there has been a strategic shift or a strategic failure on the part of the West as it is uh, so as it has succumbed to a strategic failure in, in Ukraine. It, that failure of NATO, failure of the, um, if you like, American hegemony has and is having a, a powerful influence, even though we don't see it. It's sort of, it, it creeps along, perhaps uh, not so obviously, but I think it is slowly uh, changing. And then I think Syria will play what has always been its historic role in the region as one of the main parts in the in the Middle East. But we're going to have to wait a little longer, and they have to keep their strength and um, be firm. As we say in Arabic, inshallah. Uh, inshallah, Mr. inshallah. inshallah. <laughs> Indeed, inshallah. I, I, I truly hope that this is the case. I would really like to uh, translate this last segment into Arabic and post it on my Facebook where most of the followers are um, from Syria. It's important for them to listen to your wisdom as well. Mr. Alistair, I am very thankful that you dedicated your valuable time uh, to me and for the audience of Syrian analysis. Hundreds of them were watching uh, us now live. And um, I would love uh, to have you in the future as well on my channel. You are um, a, a person that I would love to have a conversation with and learn from you. Thank you so much, really. Oh, well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure.
And thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, whether you're watching me, us on YouTube or on Rumble. If you guys want to read the articles of Alistair, I already put the link for his Al Mayadeen articles in the description below. And if you want to support my independent work, you can become a patron. The link is scrolling on the screen, patreon.com slash Syriana Analysis. And I will see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. Central European time, 12 p.m. Eastern American time. Peace be upon you, upon your families. Salam.